Uh, so, okay, let's start and let's welcome next, our next speaker, Pavel. Yeah. Hello. Uh, I work for Virtuoso. Uh, Virtuoso is a new name uh, of my current employer. We used to be called Parallels. You probably know us. Uh, we did and still do the OpenVZ project. Uh, one of the features of which is uh, containers live migration. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so the talk will be about uh, why someone might want to live migrate a container, uh, why someone want to avoid doing this, because live migrating a container is a tricky task, uh, and how tricky it is and why it's really tricky. Uh, most of you probably know that uh, live migration of, for example, virtual machines doesn't seem to be that complex. So uh, during my talk, I will refer to uh, virtual machines sometimes uh, just for comparison uh, to see uh, the complexity of containers live migration. So uh, live migration is quite simple. Uh, it's pretty much like teleportation. You take an object, uh, in our case it's a container, you get its state, uh, send it to the place you want it to have live migrated to, uh, and then restore the object back. Uh, that's, uh, in, in a few words, it, it's pretty simple. Uh, people uh, use it for several reasons. Uh, uh, examples are, for example, for load balancing. If you have a cluster of nodes uh, which run jobs and you cannot restart a job easily, uh, and one of the nodes becomes overloaded with, uh, with tasks, uh, you can take uh, some of them and move to another uh, hardware nodes uh, to balance a load uh, between them. Uh, Another usage scenario for live migration is to update the kernel. Uh, it works pretty simple. You make a hardware node free from uh, critical workloads, from containers or from virtual machines uh, by uh, moving them to another node. Uh, of course, you need a cluster to do that. Uh, then you boot a node into a new kernel, and then you can either rely on your balancer to uh, balance the workloads back or move uh, the load back manually. Uh, this case can actually be done without real life migration. Uh, you can, uh, there is a technology uh, using the saving state and restoring state uh, that can re uh, replace the kernel uh, on the running node without actually uh, life migrating, but still uh, updating the kernel uses the uh, the, the, the very core technology that saves states and restores states of containers. Uh, the third example is uh, to upgrade or replace hardware. Uh, it's the same as with updating the kernel, but in this case you cannot avoid doing real life migration because you have to power down the node. Uh, and in the end, uh, it just looks great when you know that there are two servers and you saw a container on one of them and you press a button and then you see it on another. Uh, it looks cool. Uh, the technology is nice, uh, but sometimes people would like to avoid live migration uh, because it's really complex and just like in case of teleportation, uh, some weird or uh, unwanted results uh, can be achieved. Uh, and if you want to avoid live migration, there are options how to do that. Uh, for example, uh, you can try to balance uh, not a load on your cluster, uh, but the cost of that load. For example, if you have web servers uh, uh, that generate load as response on the traffic that they receive, you can try to balance the traffic itself, like redirect the incoming requests on different nodes uh, and hope that uh, different requests will cause uh, like equal uh, workloads uh, on the servers. Uh, another way to avoid live migration is to use microservices architecture. Uh, this is when uh, your application is written so that it can be uh, shut down at any time and started uh, probably anywhere else. Uh, with this architecture, you can uh, load balance without uh, live migration just by uh, keeping the necessary amount of your application on the least loaded uh, hardware nodes. Uh, Yet another way uh, not to live migration 
it's uh, the, the the last two cases are about uh, updating the hardware or, or the kernel on the nodes. Uh, first way is how we call it a crash driven update. Uh, we see some people doing this. They continue running uh, all the kernel until it crash or hang. And once it does so, they have to reboot a node anyway. So they just reboot it uh, into a newer kernel, which should be pre-installed, of course, uh, on them. Uh, it, it works. Uh, people use it. Uh, it might not be very nice, but still. Uh, and the <coughs> uh, a nicer option of uh, doing updates uh, without live migration is to do planned downtime. Uh, like you can send an email to people uh, running workloads on your nodes and say that, guys, within uh, by the end of this week, we will uh, uh, power down nodes sequentially, so get prepared, maybe move your workloads manually or just uh, live for several minutes without them. Uh, so uh, <coughs> let's now see uh, uh, into the live migration uh, into details to find out what, why it's really complex. So uh, live migration uh, if uh, taking it simple, as I told, it consists of three, st of three steps. Steps: You get the state of a container, then copy it to another node and restore back. Uh, uh, one important thing that's uh, worth mentioning is that before getting the state of a container, the container should be frozen uh, because we should get uh, the state uh, uh, which is correct from the container point of, point of view. We cannot take states of individual processes uh, while letting them run uh, as we do it. Uh, because in this case, uh, the states we get might be not consistent with each other. Uh, of course, there is a theoretical possibility that we take processes and containers are processes and live migrate individual processes from one node to another one by one. Uh, but that's quite a complex technology. In this case, what we effectively get is a container that is scattered between two nodes. Uh, and there is no uh, alive implementation of that. So to get the correct state, we freeze the whole container. Then we read it, uh, copy to another node, uh, and restore it back. Then unfreeze and clean up uh, on, the, on the source site. Uh, the critical parameter of this process is called the frozen time. It's the time between the container gets frozen and uh, the, the moment uh, we unfreeze the container, because this is what people uh, care the most when they live migrate a container. Uh, if you work with it via the network, <coughs> typically uh, people work with containers via the network, uh, when the container has been live migrated, you will notice it as a small uh, uh, slowdown of your operations. Like the network will seem to, to get stuck for several seconds or the, the time the container has been migrated for. So the smaller the frozen time is, the better live migration is. And to Reduce uh, the freeze time. <coughs> uh, there are several options. First of all, we can try to make getting the state and restoring from state faster. Uh, but the truth is, uh, getting the state and restoring the state uh, are two operations that are extremely hard to optimize because they consist of fixed steps uh, which should be performed. Like container has uh, several processes. Each of them has to be analyzed. For each of them, the state should be read. Uh, and there is, not, there is no much room for optimization there. Uh, the biggest amount of, the biggest portion in this frozen time is actually the time that takes uh, for the state to get transferred from one node to another. And for uh, most of the cases we've seen so far, more than 90% uh, of the state contents uh, is, the, is the contents of the memory that processes use. Uh, it's not the information about how much process we have, what, what are the open files, information about connections. Uh, all this stuff is like less than 10%. It gets transferred within fractions of seconds. 90% uh, is whatever data sits in the process memory. Uh, so if we can uh, move the memory transfer out of the frozen time, uh, we can shrink it significantly without uh, even trying to optimize uh, the save state and restore state stages. Uh, and uh, luckily, uh, we can do two tricks 
uh, with the process memory. First of all, we can effectively track uh, which uh, memory pages uh, are changing uh, over the time. We can request the kernel for that information. Uh, and the second thing is that we, <coughs> at least in theory, but uh, I'll get back to this later. Nowadays, all in practice, we can uh, restore processes actually without any memory and restore the memory on demand uh, while uh, the processes start to request particular areas of it. So to uh, move the memory transfer out of the frozen time, there are two uh, ways. The first is called memory pre-copy. Uh, it's pretty simple. We uh, turn the memory tracker, uh, memory changes tracker on in the kernel, and then start copying the uh, container's memory uh, to the destination node without freezing the processes. Uh, this uh, step is called iteration. Uh, once we've copied all the memory, we can either do uh, what we did before, uh, that is freeze the container, get the state, but this time without the memory because we have transferred it, uh, copy it, restore, and the container is migrated. Or we can say that uh, the amount of memory that has changed while we've been copying it <coughs> is still too big. We would like to try uh, one more iteration. So we reset the changes tracker, copy what has changed from the previous time, uh, and do it again. Uh, in this time, uh, in this case, uh, this live migration would be safe. So once it finishes, you can be sure that your container is alive and is fully present on the destination node. You can just power down the source uh, and the container will, will, will still be alive. Uh, it has no ties to the source node. Uh, that's, that's a good side of the pre-copying. What's bad about pre-copying memory is that it's uh, unpredictable. Uh, there is no reliable way to predict how much time you would spend on iterations uh, because you have no, uh, at least before you started doing this, uh, any hints about how actively processes are using memory and how much of the memory uh, would change while you copy it. Uh, and this thing also uh, gives us the second uh, disadvantage of uh, pre-copying the memory. Uh, these iterations do not guarantee that your freeze time will always be small enough. If processes are changing the memory actively and you copy it, uh, the next iteration you might see that you still need to copy uh, lots of memory and it still should take like tens of seconds or minutes or things like that. Uh, of course you have a choice to say that okay I do not life migrate this container because it would take long, it, the life migration won't be, won't be alive. Uh, but still with this method uh, uh, there is nothing that can be done. Uh, the second way to uh, copy the memory without freezing the process is called the post-copy uh, memory migration. Uh, it works the opposite way. Uh, you freeze the container, get its state, uh, but skip all the memory contents. Every single page you just do not include in the, into the uh, state you save. Copy it, as I told, it's pretty small. It will get copied within fractions of seconds. Uh, then you restore container, but say that uh, all the memory uh, that container uses uh, sits in, uh, in the swap. Uh, this is what processes would see. In reality, uh, you would have to set up uh, a subsystem. I will get back to it uh, a little bit later. That will read the memory over the network while the processes are running and put the pages uh, with the memory contents into the proper places. Uh, with this, uh, you can well estimate the time uh, that live migration would take. Uh, you can estimate the amount of data you would transfer in the first step, the, the size of the state without the memory, it can be well estimated. Uh, and you know the total memory, the total size of the memory that containers use and you will on, all, only transfer it once so knowing the speed of the network and the size, you can say that, okay, my live migration will complete within maybe five minutes, uh, within which a uh, couple of seconds the container would be frozen and leaving on the source node. Uh, but that's the only uh, good thing about uh, memory post copy. Uh, the problem with it is that it's really unsafe. Uh, so once you have uh, live migrated your container and it has started working on the destination node, uh, you still cannot uh, shut down the source node. Uh, if you power it down or if it crashes, 
Uh, the container can die as well because uh, some parts of its memory may still be on the source node. You may have not yet copied it. Uh, and the second bad thing about uh, memory post copying is that it actually slows applications down significantly. When you start an application without a single page uh, in RAM, uh, it will start accessing it immediately. It will wait for the memory transfer, will wait for uh, the kernel to find this page and put it into a process address space, and this will happen with every single page. For the first uh, seconds, maybe minutes, uh, applications will work slowly, like if you put all the memory into real swap and uh, ask them to continue running. Uh, <clears throat> so with these two things, uh, really live migration, which uh, keeps the frozen time really small, uh, which is almost unnotice unnoticeable by, by human, uh, it's slightly more complex than just read state, copy, and restore state. It includes uh, several optional iterations of pre-copying, uh, it includes freezing and saving the state. Uh, then we copy, restore, and unfreeze. And <coughs> uh, optionally, we uh, post-copy the memory uh, to, 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 to the container. Uh, so to, to get an idea why this uh, is that complex for containers, uh, let's see uh, the things we have to deal with when we talk about containers. So uh, when we live migrate a container, we take effectively a tree of processes uh, with all the kernel objects that these processes use. Files, uh, sockets, sessions, process groups, uh, all, all the memory, when it comes to processes as compared to virtual machines, uh, memory layout is much more complex for containers. Uh, all the Linux specific stuff like iNotifies, signal file descriptors, uh, all of this. Uh, then, uh, when life migrating a container, we should take containers environment, uh, which consists of namespaces and C groups. Uh, and of course, the memory contents itself. Uh, so, uh, first, complexity comes when we try to uh, pre-copy the memory. Uh, the problem is that there is no such thing as container memory. Uh, there is no a place in the kernel where you can go and ask for it to give you all the pages that are used by this container. Uh, instead, uh, you should first collect the processes that sit inside container, uh, this is relatively easy, uh, but then you have to individually analyze every single process uh, to find out which memory the process use. Uh, and uh, since we're talking about Linux containers, uh, in Linux there are effectively four types of memory that processes can use. Uh, this can be uh, anonymous private memory, anonymous shared memory, file private and file shared memory. Uh, all this stuff should be first collected into uh, <coughs> Uh, into a system that uh, uh, reads the state of the process. Uh, all the sharing of the pages and of the mappings should be resolved. And only after that, we have an idea of what memory is uh, in use by the containers, and we can start uh, actually copying it uh, to the destination node. Uh, then goes the second, state, uh, second step, when we save the state of the containers. Uh, Again, unlike virtual machines, when the state uh, should be read from a, a tree of objects of uh, known amount and of fixed size, it's mostly virtual hardware and uh, powered stuff. Uh, container, e e even an average container, uh, it forms a graph of objects uh, which consists of thousands of nodes. And this graph is uh, oriented. Uh, every single node has different uh, attributes you have to deal with. Uh, and there is no, again, in the kernel, a single place where you can uh, call and say, okay, save me the state of this uh, set of process, for example. Uh, actually, uh, we've tried to go this way uh, some time ago. We've, uh, we've sent a, a patch set to the Linux kernel community, adding the subsystem that uh, saved the state of the processes and restored the state of the processes. Uh, but the kernel guys decided that uh, this big uh, button uh, that does this magic is, uh, is a bad design. Nobody wanted to have this in the kernel. Uh, so instead of doing all this stuff uh, in the kernel space, uh, we decided to do it in the user space. Uh, so we wrote, uh, uh, we started a project called Crew. Uh, 
it's a system level tool that uh, does all that magic I'm right now talking about. It take a tree of processes and analyzes which processes are there, which objects they use, uh, all this uh, uh, stuff about memory, and saves this information in, into a set of files on disk. Uh, and to uh, achieve this goal, Creo uses uh, quite a lot of kernel APIs. Uh, it uh, reads, opens and reads uh, quite a lot of proc files. It uses several Netlink uh, protocols to get information, for example, about uh, active connections. Uh, it actively uses debugging interface, ptrace uh, system call. Uh, and the thing is that all these APIs are quite diverse. There is no single or unified API for different types of objects in the kernel to get uh, uh, information about their state. Uh, every single, every new object that appears and that we have to support in uh, Creo, uh, they typically all have their own API to get information from. Uh, <clears throat> This is pretty much the same for the restore. Uh, restore, unlike, unlike virtual machines, when you cre create a fixed amount of objects and just copy their state inside with single instructions, uh, we have to recreate this graph of thousands of objects. Uh, and yet again, there is no, as I told, single uh, entry point into the kernel where we can feed some information and say, OK, please start all this stuff from the very beginning. Uh, Instead, Creo uh, recreates all this stuff literally by hands. It forks processes, it opens files, it calls all the system calls uh, that can uh, get, a tree of uh, get a tree of processes into the state we need. Uh, and uh, there is a word, word saying emphasized on the slide. Uh, this means that some uh, configurations that we can see on the uh, Linux boxes that process uh, get into, uh, they do not have direct ways to get into this. For example, the simplest example is, the, is process sessions. Uh, session, uh, there is no system call that take arbitrary process and put it into an arbitrary section, uh, session. Uh, the session process lives in can be either inherited from the parent or created its own session from the very beginning. So in case we see some tricky combination that process lives, lives in a session without a session leader and which uh, is a child of some uh, third process, uh, we cannot just fork this process and create a session and move it into it with, for example, three calls. We have to create fake processes that keep sessions open while they are being populated, then do uh, tricks with reparenting, uh, reparenting process on the tree and so on. Uh, and this stays true for quite a lot of kernel APIs. Uh, all the APIs for recreating stuff is also very diverse. Uh, and uh, Creo has to do with this complexity to recreate that stuff. Uh, and the last uh, interesting step uh, is memory post copying. Uh, this thing is already Im implemented by Andrea Arcangeli. Uh, the thing is called user fault FD. Some of you might have probably seen this in the kernel. Uh, Andrea did this to make uh, post uh, copy memory migration for KVM. Uh, so he implemented user fault FD so that, well, user fault FD in simple words is a file descriptor using which you can catch uh, page faults from the kernel and uh, put pages back into it to uh, handle the page faults instead of letting the kernel find the page somewhere. Uh, the user fault FD current implementation uh, implies that the process doing page faults in its address space and the process reading, in, uh, reading events from the file descriptor is the same process. Maybe different threads, but still the same process which share the uh, virtual me memory between each other. Uh, for containers, uh, this is not the case. We cannot uh, make the processes that we have restored handle this user fault FD thing and uh, uh, repopulate their own address space. Instead, the process that uh, accesses the memory is one process, and the process that owns the user fault FD and puts memory into it is another process. Uh, and current uh, implementation of user fault FD uh, doesn't allow for that. Uh, for example, if the process uh, uh, which is being monitored calls fork or remaps areas or does some tricky stuff with M advisors, uh, the process that listens on the user fault FD uh, 
uh, may get confused. Uh, there is no notifications about this stuff coming into user fault FD. Uh, this is uh, what was called non-cooperative mode of user fault FD, uh, and it's currently work in progress. Hopefully, someday it will hit the mainline and we'll have uh, post copy for uh, containers live migration. Uh, and other, other than this, uh, before live migrating container, we have to do one thing which is pretty similar for virtual machines. We have to check that CPUs are compatible between source and destination node. Uh, this is slightly more complex than uh, the same for virtual machines because for virtual machines the uh, masks that are reported by CPU ID can be emulated inside the guest so you can uh, make some assumptions about uh, source and destination CPU incompatibility for containers. Uh, they see all the CPU features uh, that are on the hardware so it should be done more carefully. Uh, and the second thing that is container specific is that we have to check that kernels on source node and destination node are compatible. Uh, and here I'm not talking about the binary compatibility because uh, kernel community is known for keeping the binary compatibility for, for ages. Like you can uh, be pretty sure that uh, the binary API that is in 4. something kernels is the same as for 2. even 4. Uh, this is mostly about the features, feature presence. Like if you have certain, uh, I don't know, net filter mo mod modules loaded on the source node, the same should be present on the destination one. For virtual machines, this is not an option. So this is container specific thing. Uh, all this stuff uh, I've, I've just described uh, is already implemented. Uh, Inside two projects, first, first I have already mentioned, it's called CRIU. Uh, CRIU is an acronym, it's a checkpoint and restore in user space. It's a tool written in C which does all the time critical stuff. Uh, it saves state and restores state, dealing with all this complexity I have just described. Uh, and it also provides uh, an API to set up and actually run memory pre and post. Post is still not in the mainstream but still uh, memory pre and post copy stuff. Uh, but that's only saving the state and restoring the state. To properly uh, synchronize all this stuff to handle iterations for pre-copying and setting up connections between uh, source node and destination one, uh, we have a, a sister project called pHole. Uh, Right now, basically, it's just a Python script that uh, performs all the necessary pre-checks before live migration and then calls crew to start pre-copying the memory, uh, saving the state, copies it over the wire, restores, and probably set up uh, memory post-copy again using crew. Uh, and uh, one feature that we have also put into the p-hole is, uh, uh, is handling the file system. Uh, if you have shared file system between source and destination, that, that's simple. You do not have to do any special about this, but if the file system is not shared, the file system should also be copied between nodes. Uh, it will make live migration longer, but yet again there are ways to uh, make the, to, not to make this while the processes are frozen, thus still reducing the freeze time. Uh, both processes are open source. Uh, the main entry point is crew.org website. Uh, it's a wiki. Uh, there is a, a category called pHole where we collect all the live migration related stuff. Uh, if you want to participate, uh, join our mailing list. It's crew at openvz.org. We put news on the Google Plus page and on Twitter, uh, and the source code sits uh, on the GitHub. This is all I have. If there are any questions, we have presents for the best question asker. I have a small question. What is on the logo of p like, like I got the logo of Creo. Uh, it's not this, I think. But Creo is a fire bird. It's, uh, it's a bird from Russian fairy tales. And the p is a hunchback horse. It's yet another Russian fairy tale. Okay, the question was how do we live migrate shared library state? Uh, 
when we uh, get a state of a process, we do not actually care whether, well, library is present as a, a virtual memory region inside the process. And when we read the virtual memory regions inside the process, we do not really care whether it's just a file or a library or whatever, whatever else. Uh, we just see uh, at, at, a flex, this, uh, at a flex this mapping was created with. Uh, either it was shared or private. If it's shared, then we just uh, get the information about starting and ending point in the file uh, th that was mapped. If it's private, uh, then we go to the kernel and ask for which pages has been copy and write it from this file and take them into the image. Uh, and that's it. And th there is no difference uh, in uh, getting the state for a library or just a file mapped by an application. Okay, so the question is about uh, capability, about security context, right? Uh, uh, the answer is uh, uh, right now, uh, the, the whole thing only works if you run Crew as super user, as root. Uh, in this case, it can create everything and then uh, trim down its capabilities to whatever state is appropriate. Uh, if someone wants to run Crew from a regular user and we have such requests from OpenMPI guys, they run their stuff as uh, just <coughs> some user on, on the host. Then we have patched Crew to do saving the state part because saving the state could be done regardless of the security restrictions by the kernel, but saving the state can be done. Uh, restoring the state is quite tricky and it's not yet implemented and not, not because of the uh, capabilities, but because we need to recreate the processes with the exact same PIDs they had before. For unprivileged user, this is only possible if you spawn a user namespace and the PID namespace. But in this case, what you have restored might not be completely equal to what you have dumped previously. So this thing is yet to be resolved. Right now, resol uh, restore only works for the root user, which can do anything. Yeah, yeah. What's the, what's the impact on the performance of the container will life migrate? Yeah, the, because during the migration of the container, during the, the, the live migration, uh -huh. you have some performance degradation. What is the lesson of it, It's not a performance degradation, it's a freeze time when the container doesn't respond. Uh, like yeah, but, but after you after you take the snapshot, snapshot, yeah? And uh, the freeze time, after the freeze time, uh, yeah. Ah, when using the post copy memory. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it really depends on the application, right? Uh, <clears throat> uh, what we've seen before, uh, at least in the OpenZ users, they, they mostly suffered from the freeze time, but not from the uh, delay they got after restoring. Uh, because this uh, post copy migration, there are two tricks that can uh, like reduce this impact. We can check which page we, the container would require first by checking its IP address, uh, IP register, uh, and uh, uh, some more registers. And just fetching the pages, this couple of pages, it won't take time, but the, proce the process will get them immediately. So this slowdown is really not that big. You're talking about TCP probably, right? Uh, or any yeah, connection? Netlink, okay. Uh, so Netlink is uh, r relatively simple because it's a connection between the process and, and the kernel. We just recreate the socket back. Uh, if we see that there is some data in the socket, we 
Uh, for now, we do not uh, we refuse dumping that container because it's quite unusual situation. Process typically read all the data from NetLink sockets immediately. So we can unfreeze it, wait for a second, and try to do it again. The socket will be empty. Uh, Unix sockets are not that complex too because they all connect processes within one container. So we can just read them uh, using the Unix diag module in the kernel. Uh, that's a model that SS2 uses to fetch the information. Uh, and we can actually read the data from the sockets without removing it from there. There is a MSG peak flag in the REC from MSG system call which just copies the data and leaves it there. Uh, and at restore time we do the same, we recreate the sockets and write the data back into it. Uh, the most interesting case is TCP connections. For TCP connections we have patched the kernel. Uh, you can uh, Google for TCP data. Uh, TCP repair socket option. Uh, it's a socket option with which we can freeze the socket and get all the critical TCP uh, information like sequence numbers, uh, timestamps, uh, scaling factors, all the parameters that sit on the socket. And uh, then we can create a socket, put it into repair mode again, and force it to have the sequences, timestamp, and all the stuff that comes from the user space. This makes TCP sockets live migration. Yes, this is how seamless kernel update is working. You can say reboot and restore, but in this case, uh, the freeze time will be quite big. Uh, not because of the kernel slow boot, but because you'll have to read everything from disk. Uh, we have a proof of concept technology that keeps container in RAM while rebooting the kernel with k-exec, so it doesn't disappear. We can do it many times faster. Uh, yes, there is one thing. Currently, we see that qu quite a big portion of uh, getting the state uh, is spent on uh, accessing proc files. Opening, reading, and surprisingly closing them. Closing takes uh, like 30% of this time. Strange thing, but it takes. So uh, we have, uh, again, proof of concept patches that implement a Netlink protocol that can get this information in binary format and not in process by process, but in a batch manner. It saves lots of time, but it's still not yet in the upstream. With what? Okay. Docker. Uh, the, the answer is uh, we have created, well, we took, took part in creating namespaces and C groups inside kernel, uh, on top of which later Docker introduced uh, Docker files and this layering management system. But uh, we and them are two different companies and developers. In the existing versions of Virtuoso, we still don't do it, unfortunately, but uh, in next Virtuoso, which will be Virtuoso 8, uh, something like that would appear, yeah. Okay, thanks. Да, забыл я шарфики раздать. Ничего страшного. Упс.
Раз, раз. О. Thank you everyone for attending the presentations. We really appreciate your feedback. Please free, feel free to provide it on our official website. Uh, you can also tweet uh, about the event or uh, create a blog post. There is actually a competition for the best blog post, so you can get some prizes for that. Thank you very much. This is surprise, like the guy is not from Red Hat over here. You're not from Red Hat? But well, yeah, oh. not everyone is from Red Hat. Yeah, it shouldn't be, but in, in reality, you know what happens. Yeah, yeah. The thing is, Red Hat is the only one like, of two open source big companies. Right? Yeah. So it's very hard, you know, to Probably yeah, a very uh, from other companies when they, they are only small ones. There is no really oh yeah, yeah. two open source corporations. Uh, open source corporation doesn't make up, but yeah. There is some. Yeah, that's a right. uh, that should work kind of mutant. Ahoj. 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 Aho